journal article. So there are two aims with which you can review. One is basically to change your practice. So you need to really understand whether that journal article is applicable to your study or not. So first of all, what will be the criteria? So suppose you want to change your practice and you're reading an article. When will you change your practice, science? So when it has been validated on a large sample. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, it has to be, you should be sure that the results that are there are actually valid or not. So when we say valid and uh, what is the difference between validity and reliability? Or precision and accuracy. Precision is that we get the same result if it is repeated and, mm -hmm. and accuracy is uh, if you get the correct result. Yeah, same is valid. So validity and accuracy are the same, which basically means that this is what is there. This is the truth. While when you talk about reliability or when you talk about precision, it is that this is what you do every time. So every time you do that, you may make the same error or you may still be valid. So this is the basic difference between that. So first of all, the primary thing would be whether the test is valid or not. If the report which is given, the results which are given in the journal are not valid, you don't have to change your practice. The second step would be that whether the validity has to be in a contextual manner. So whether some study is valid from maybe a particular very developed country in which they are using a special type of insulin pump and they are using a closed loop sensor and the topic that we will discuss about, whether they, the same thing is applicable in our country or not becomes important. So what is that? So one is validity. What is the second concept we are talking about? It is known as whether the results from one particular study can be extrapolated into the other. It is known as generalizability. So whether you can generalize the result also is not or is there or not. So that's why you need to be very, very careful about the study population, the interventions and whether your study population matches with all or not. Third would of course be when it is valid, it is generalizable, but as Sain was saying, what is the strength of that? So if there is a single study for the first time, you will not want to change immediately. So what is the strength of the study? And we already know that there are various levels of evidences we talk about. And we talk about how case reports are the lowest this thing, and then we go about descriptive studies, then we talk about randomized trials, and then we talk about meta-analysis. And all those things become relevant. So what is the strength of association? The consistency of association. And then only we decide that, okay, now we can change the practice. So every year, there are thousands and thousands of papers which are published. In fact, every second, you will have so many papers which are coming up. But how many of them actually change the practice is an important question. And people have done research and they found that it is maybe less than 0.1% which will actually make a difference which is there. Now, the reason that is that probably one, of course, is that there is so much information overload. There is inertia on part of the doctor that we don't change our practice very easily. All those factors are there. But I think somehow the papers themselves have to present them in a manner that becomes important for us to change. So what we'll try to do is first of all, look at what to look at in a paper when you're reading that. Because we have got real amount of information overload now. So first of all, you have to decide which paper is relevant for you or not. And then whether that the findings of that paper are going to be important in that perspective or not. And this becomes crucial in that regard. So you have to look at the validity as we pointed out. So it has to be measuring in an accurate fashion. The next step will be generalizing. So whether you can generalize the findings to your phase or not, and whether your practice will change or not becomes important in that regard. So we'll go through a few papers and see how we can change and review and what becomes important. So first of all, when you see a paper, the first thing is that whether you want to really go ahead and read the paper or not. If you look at that, if you see people, what they were doing maybe around 50 years ago, they used to read each and every news item which is there in the paper. People used to read for hours and study and everything. Now, because time is less, information is too much, people started reading just maybe the first three lines. Then they started reading just the headlines and now nothing at all. Same is true for papers also. People used to read the entire manuscript. Getting it was so difficult. But now, I think what people will look at is basically the first title. And I think that becomes very, very important. So as we discussed last time about writing a paper, 
that you need to keep your uh, title very very crisp in that regards that is relevant because from a audience perspective if you don't find it interesting you won't go into it so like if you see this paper it says effect of metformin which is the intervention on vascular function which is the outcome of children with type 1 diabetes which is basically the study population that design randomized trial so i think this is a very very precise title which tells you exactly what this paper is it is looking at a particular intervention in a particular study population over a given period using a randomized trial so this is how your title should be because this tells you and whether you want to read it or not first of all you are interested in type 1 or not you are interested in cardiovascular outcome or not you will know that so this title becomes very very important in that regard so we we'll use this paper as basically the template when we talk about all the discussion how to review it and this will become relevant when you review any other paper at any point of time so what do you look at in a paper so first thing is that why was this study done now most people why do you think is the most common uh, people do study especially in india the thing gene intervention Maybe to the no specific. So most studies that that been done in India is just to publish mm -hmm. or just to do some thesis or it's just a global phenomenon. So most people research we talk about overwhelming amount of research is basically just to get it published. You have to do a thesis. You have to maybe write a paper for a particular position, and that's why things are done. It's not because of a particular reason. Because of that. when there is the why is not related to science the outcome also will not be that much related to science so you have to be very clear why the study was done second how was it done and you have to be very very clear about how because how will decide about whether the first of all interventions were appropriate or not whether the interventions were assessed in a proper fashion or not the outcome was measured properly and then you will know okay whether you can then lie them into your clinical findings or not and what exactly did they find will become important what is their impact and this becomes important so the first thing is why is the study done that's the primary thing and that will really tell you a lot about uh, why thing that so if you read any newspaper report you will know why this report is been written you will see sometimes that they will talk about certain new launches so they are promotional news you will see that some uh, leader talked about that so these are all driven by an agenda so what's the agenda of the paper becomes important so this condition so we are talking about this paper of the cardiovascular disease in diabetes and the effect of metformin so now whether that's relevant for you or not becomes important so now if you talk about from your perspective i think we all know that type 1 diabetes is a cardiac risk even if a patient with type 1 diabetes does not have any cardiac abnormality you consider it equivalent to a ca Forty year old type one diabetic automatically becomes a CAD equal, which is a big issue. So that is a very very important thing from that perspective because cardiovascular disease is common in type one diabetes. It's a leading cause of mortality, so this is an important issue. So you have to decide whether it is relevant or not. There is a need to predict for that. Now you want because you are talking about children; they don't have any cardiac problem now, but they will have problem later. so you need to have some form of a predictor as to what decides about cardiac outcome so you have got a vascular function so what they have done of course they can't say that, okay we give metformin now and 25 years later we will just follow them up and see how much how many of them had a cardiac event or not that's possible for adults if you talk about all the trials we talk about cardiovascular effects but not for children so what they have done is that they have taken a surrogate marker to see whether that surrogate marker is being changed or not So this brings your first question: whether this vascular function really has any link with mortality or not. So this, these are the questions which will keep on coming to your mind. So they are saying, okay, they are saying vascular functions are better. But what I'm going to do with vascular function if it does not mean a better cardiac mortality later on or not? The third issue is what really is the intervention, which here is very very clear in this case. So this study is pretty. crisp in that design that they are using a particular intervention to improve vascular function they are not claiming that you have a impact on cbd but this is what they actually are implying that if you improve vascular function now you will have an improvement later on if you are giving an antiresorptive agent and you say that this was it has been given your bmd will start rising in 2 years maybe too much 
So what you're looking at is that you look at bone resorption markers in a couple of months and you say, okay, now we see that the urinary collagens are low, which basically means that there is some response which is already happening. So anti-resorption is working. Bone density may take a long time. So we can't wait for the response to see. Same as this, so if your vascular functions are better, it may suggest that there will be an improvement in that perspective. So this is, so in a way, if you talk about why this is a good study, to study in that perspective. Now, if we talk about what is known, so first of all, you need to know what is known in your study. So what is the existing knowledge? What are the lacunas? And this is not only important from reviewing a paper, this is also important when you are actually planning a research proposal. You need to know each and everything. Your maximum literature review, usually you start doing it once you've written everything. This should start before you're planning. Because if you see that, okay, this work has already been done. If you see that you want to say, okay, how many percent of type 1 patients have celiac disease? You've got 100 people out there. It's a waste of anything to do that. So you look at some other specific pointers. What are the lacunas which are there? So maybe you have not got the data about follow-up of celiac and how many becomes type 1. There may be something you may find up in that regard. Do need study and that will be relevant rather than keep on repeating the previous existing data. Now what will be done is very, very important. What are their aims and objectives in that regards? Now first of all, who becomes important? So design, this is a double-blind randomized controlled trial, which is considered to be the highest level of evidence in the situation. Center, so what they've done is that they have used two specific centers, particularly in Adelaide and Western uh, Australia, and these centers, so that's very important to have the setting. Now, whether those centers and the patient population will match to the population in Kanpur would be another question that you will come up. So these questions will keep on coming to you when you really think of whether it's being relevant or not. The third is what are the participants? So they have used type 1 diabetes, 8 to 18 years of age, BMI more than 50 percent. Do you agree with this? Do you think this is a good selection? So type 1, 8 to 18, of course, why 8 to 18? You think? Why not less than 8? No. Yes, so before puberty, the metabolic complications are usually very unusual. So in our study, which is going to come up very soon, and in any study you will see, they will say that before puberty, the chances of metabolic anomalies are very low. So if you choose less than 8 years, it will be a waste of sample, and there will be no difference we will find. Why did they use BMI more than 50th percentile? Yes, so they are wanting to exclude those who are lean, basically. So if somebody is lean, the chances of having a cardiac dysfunction is low. So what they're trying to do is that, suppose if you give in general population, let's say you give metformin to everyone. Now in general population, the cardiovascular risk factor will maybe, let's say, 10%. So there the intervention will have to be done in a much larger number of people than a high risk population. Suppose you have a high risk, in which there is a 60% chance. Of a cardiovascular dysfunction. The sample size required would probably be at least six times more in the general population compared to that. So if you make it more than eight years, so those are gone. Those who are lean, the chances of metabolic complications are there, they are gone. So this is a very smart move of cutting out in terms of sample size because the more the sample size, everything will cause more confusion. And exclusion, what they have done is hypoglycemia, recurring BK, statin, antihabitation. So statin antihabitation, why have they excluded? Because they have existing disease already, which means that somebody is on statin means that there is some cardiovascular disease, this is hypertension. So they are obviously doing it somebody who's established problem, there's no point. And hypoglycemia, recurrent DK are probably uh, sort of a marker of inappropriate control, which may have an effect. So extremes of them they have excluded. Now, what did they do? They gave metformin less than 60 kg, 1 gram, more than 60 kg, 2 gram. This is a random dose they selected, which is fine, which you can't much object. This is their study. Then they looked at vascular function. So now this becomes very important. What you need to know is that whether these vascular function markers are really correlated with a cardiovascular outcome or not. So what you're seeing here is that they used a flow mediated dilatation. So what is flow mediated dilatation? 
So this is a marker of how good is the vascular compliance. And then what they did was that they gave GTA, which is a nitrate, and how much is dilated. So if your vessels are stiff, their response will be less. If they are more compliant, their response will be better. The other way to assess compliance is the speed. So you do a Doppler and see the speed of vessels. If the speed is more, what does it mean? More. So and rigid. More rigid. So that means less compliant. So that is the marker which is there. Now secondary outcome, they also looked at other factors. So they saw how much did metformin change the engine dose, the HbA1c, the sensitivity, and these are the factors. So now they used a very interesting formula to calculate insulin sensitivity because otherwise insulin sensitivity is a very difficult thing. How do you measure insulin sensitivity? You basically have a closed loop. So in a way, you have got a clamp in which you are giving an insulin at a particular dose and you are giving dextrose on a particular dose. So the amount of insulin required for a particular glucose infusion rate, so at 6 mg per kg per minute, how much insulin is required, that will give you the sensitivity of insulin. You get the point? So what they've done is that, because that is not easy for everybody, they have used an uh, equation from a different study which uses very basic parameters, base circumference, insulin dose, and one with adiponectin, and you get an idea of insulin dose. Now this again, these are all confounding factors. You have to really understand whether this applies or not. So when you're really digging deep into that, you need to understand that this sensitivity is a calculated sensitivity based upon some parameters and not an actual sensitivity. But since this is not a primary outcome measure, I'm not bothered. From a clinical perspective, I'll be happy if the HbA1c improves, if the dose comes down, and maybe if these parameters are better. Sensitivity, of course, is a different thing altogether. Of course, if your insulin dose comes down, sensitivity is better, isn't it? That's a pretty much straightforward. But this is for more from academic perspective. They put the thing. They looked at other things like lipid, adipocytokine, and DEXA as well. Now, and vascular structure by the uh, intermediate thickness, the carotid uh, medial thickness was considered as a marker of atherosclerotic development. So the major outcome, now when you're looking at the study, what is the primary outcome measure? Because the sample size is determined based upon your primary outcome measure. These are all second. Now, if you say that my sample size was designed from poor flow mediated dilatation, but I also found that HbA1c was reduced. Do you think this HbA1c finding is significant or not? It's your not calculation of sample size was based on vascular function, but your study also showed that HbA1c was significantly decreased. Do you think that this is significant or not? Why? Because it's not the primary outcome, so sample size is gained by the... Okay, so what do you mean if you are saying that HbA1c fall was there, you are able to see that, then you are saying that error, what is the error that happened? Okay, so basically what you need to understand is the importance of power of the study. So when you say the power of the study, what does the sample size is only to do with power, nothing at all. So when you say power, what does it mean? Power simply means, you can, I can put it very simply, is the power of your glasses. You are two people sitting there. I am not able to see the difference between the two because I am not using glasses. When I wear the glasses, my power becomes more, I can see the difference. Okay, you get the point? So the sample size only has got a role with the power of study. And the power of study tells you to differentiate, find the difference when there is difference. You get it? The second is not finding a difference when there is no difference. So there's a two different things to look at. First of all, you should say that, okay, one error will happen. Okay, there is a difference. I am not seeing. Okay. Second difference will be there is no difference and I am seeing a difference. These are the two types of error, type 1 and type 2 error. So when you talk about the power of the study, the power of the study is basically looking at the ability to differentiate real difference. So if you're two people sitting in front of me without my glasses, I'm not able to see you. And then when I say able to see with glasses, it means that there is a power issue. But let's put it another way. If even without glasses, I can say there is a difference. What does it mean? There is a big difference. 
difference. The very fact that your HPA1C, it was not powered enough to detect the HPA1C difference, but it was 12 and it was 6. So even if you are seeing from moon, you might see the difference. So in that case, you don't need to increase the samples. If you are able to detect a difference, it means you are well powered. This is a big concept to remember. So just because reflexly, if you say, that, okay, it is not calculated for that, if you are able to see a difference, that is significant. On the other hand, if you say that, okay, there is no difference, that may not be valid unless your sample size is powered during that. This is an important concept to understand. So from that perspective, now what they did, they used medication, look at adverse effects and how much they were taking, compliance, adherence, all those things were taken into consideration in that regard. Now what they did, they found sample size basically for flow mediated dilation. This is what I'm saying that they have to choose an end point. This is your primary outcome. Rest all is secondary. So it's like that you're focusing on the eye of the bird when you're taking in other thing, you're not looking at other things. Other things are later, so they're not related. So flow mediated dilatation of 3.1%. So they assume that if you give metformin, if you want to detect a difference of more than 3.1% with a power of 90%, and a level of significance of 0.05. This is what they treated, and then they will get a sample search. The model basically they use was intention to treat. What is intention to treat? Intention to treat means all the individuals get the same treatment, uh, I mean, irrespective of which group they are in. in that correct? So, intention to treat analysis is a very important thing. Suppose you treat 100 people, okay? 50 are treating, obviously not all will receive metformin because it's a RCT. So of course that logic is not valid. So when you say it is uh, our intention to treat, it basically is looking at the uh, a situation wherein you are assuming that everybody in the treatment group has been treated. Whether you have a loss to follow up, whether the patient is taking medicine or not, there is a side effect, he will still be counted. So what you to mean that if somebody is in the metformin group, you will assume that everybody has received the treatment and analysis will be done on everybody. Whether he is on metformin, off metformin or anything. This is different from the other analysis in which you will exclude those. Now what will happen is that, okay, I find that these patients are not doing well in terms of physical activity and exercise. I do something and say, okay, in we remove these people and uh, we'll say that they were non-adherent, non-compliant. So what will happen, you will have a bias. You will have a bias which will cause your results to be better off. So that's why this concept of intention to treat comes in, which basically means, okay, they are in the treatment group, whether they are treated or not treated, adherence, what about it, you have to include their analysis as a treated, which is a much robust thing in a practical sense, so that all these biases go off. Now the analysis they did, was a continuous parameter using a linear model. So we'll go into all that later on when we talk about statistics. And they did a binary as well. So it was like a multiple regression and then two, one is to one different page. So now this is how you have to critically analyze each and every point. So now, do you agree with intention to treat? Yes, if they had not done intention to treat, we could have asked that why did not they do the intention to treat. Now what happened was that these are the baseline characteristics. So now when you look at the baseline characteristics, there is no p-value. Should there be a p-value or not? Yes, sir. But why has JCM not objected from them for not putting up a p-value? Do you think the general words anybody would say that? Yes. So the general rule is that if you are having a very randomized uh, trial, you uh, do not report the p-value. Basically, you have to give the basic characteristics. So it's 13.3, 14 age, uh, gender 2025, 5.8, 5.2. So they assume that if your randomization is good, there will be no difference. But if you have, what do you mean by when there is a difference? When you say P is equal to 0 0.05, what does it mean? In 95% of the time, you will get the same response. You will get that response. I mean, then you will get difference. When you say a p-value is uh, it's less than 0 0.05, it basically means that more than 95% this is not because of chance. Okay? 
when you say 95% confidence interval, you say that 95% times the results will be between this and this. So P value less than 0 0.05 is basically telling you that maybe it's a less than 5% chance that there is a, this is because of chance, it is mostly because of a cause. But what does it mean? It means that it could still be because of chance. But if you have 100 things to compare, there may be one or two parameters which may become significant just by chance. So that is why people have stopped giving the p-value. A lot of people have really moved away from p-value now because p-value is a chance measure in that reading. So we will talk about confidence interval and the overlaps and all those things there. So in baseline data, no p-value, but that is fine with us. <coughs> now this is very important. This talks about the consort diagram. I'm not going to go into individual parts. It talks about how many were assessed, how many were included. So if you see, they started off with 428 people for eligibility, and finally they took 90. So it's a big study. You can't, because so many things have to be done there, so 90 is a good number. Getting more will be difficult. Now they looked into adherence. Now this is the most important. Metformin patients are taking metformin or not. If they're not taking metformin, how will this uh, going to be relevant? So they looked at adherence using the pill count. So they actually counted the pill. So they were given this box. Now I can throw the pill that will everything all together, but that's the way you can. So they looked at pill count, how many of them were actually uh, taking the medicine, how many is this thing they were to get the box back, how many are taking that. So all those things will assist. And they themselves say that it can't be 100%. So what they're saying is that in three months, first three months it was 88.9%, and then it gradually decreased over time, which is a reasonable thing. If you say it was 100%, people will say you are wrong. You're telling a lie, which is of course not possible in the real world. Now, what really happened in the study, and this becomes important. So if you remember, the most important thing was flow mediated dilatation. So what you are seeing is that this is placebo and this is metformin. And what you are seeing here is that the placebo is lower as compared to metformin. When you go at six months, the difference is not that huge. And at 12 months, the percentage units is a bit different. So what they are saying is that there is no difference per se on the flow mediated dilation, which is the first thing which is coming out of it from the study. Now, GTN response was there. So if you see GTN response, they did see that the p-value was changing. What thing do you think have they have done? Which statistical analysis would they have done in comparing these same individuals over time on multiple occasions? Which test? T-test, chi-square, which test? So this is basically a continuous variable which is being done multiple times, multiple groups. So this will be a repeated measure ANOVA. Analysis of variance is being done. Which they found that there was difference only in the GTN. Now if you look at a glycemic control, what you see is interesting. You find that the HPA1C came down by minus 1%. Now this is interesting because in type 2, metformin causes 1. So this is a good decrease in HPA1C. Most studies otherwise do not show a huge difference in HPA1C with metformin. What they also find was that insulin dose decreased. So there was a maybe 20%, so 0.9 to 0.7. So there was a 25% decline in insulin dose, which is good. So if you are able to cut down your insulin dose from 50 units to 45 units, or 40 units rather in that setting, and your HB1C is 1% better. That means metformin is good. So I am looking, I'm not that much bothered about flow mediated dilatation. If you now look at my interest in the paper, my interest will be more in these parameters because these are real-time immediate results. That is a long term. That is relevant or not is a different thing altogether. But this is a good thing. It shows us that HB1C comes down by 1%, 9 to 9.5 to 9. And what you are seeing is that there is a insulin dose reduction also, which is a good thing happening here. Now what the other thing you have to see is that the mean HPA1C even in the Western Australia and all those regions is around 9.5A. So which means that there is a very difficult thing to really control HPA1C. It's not easy to achieve that 6.5 target which you always say. So if we get 8.5, 9, 9.5 target, it is not that bad in comparison. Now, if you look at other markers, no difference at all in LDL, HDL, total cholesterol, triglycerides, so metformin does not change 
any of those parameters, it does have some effect on left paper. I think this could be a chance debate, so I wouldn't be too bothered about that. So the only difference probably from my side is that there is an improvement in HDA1C which is happening. And these are the other things that look at complications, blood pressure, everything, which was not really effective. Adverse effects, important. So, of course, there will be more gastrointestinal effects with metformin, which were more common. Otherwise, there was not much. It was a pretty safe drug. No increase in terms of PKA. Of course, if your insulin requirement goes down, there will be some increase in mild to moderate hypoglycemia, but not huge. So, it was a safe medicine, except for the GI side effects, which happened. So, if we just maybe summarize metformin use was associated with an improved glycemic control, lower amount of uh, HbA1c with a lower dose in that situation. Now, if you look at the results, the issue now is the validity. So the key thing is that whether it is valid in our study for us or not. So this is the number and course. The general liability will depend upon the compliance and how many of them were lost to follow up and what was the objective. So primary objective will be the first thing to look at. Then you go at secondary and then you look at post hoc. So what is post hoc? Post hoc is basically when you try to do a subgroup analysis. Okay, now I say oh, girls more affected, boys more affected, those who had a BMI between 50 to 75th, 75th to 90th. This is not your primary design, but now you're trying to fish out data. So this is usually done when you, your primary result is not there. In this case, your primary result is not that much good. You try to say something, that sort of a thing will happen. So post hoc analysis, you have to take it with a pinch of salt always in that regard. Now, if we see what they conclude, now this is very important. People may try to conclude what is uh, much more than what they found in the study. So this becomes important. So we have to read that. We report that metformin improved vascular smooth function during 12 months in above average weight children with type 1 diabetes. Now, how did they conclude? We threw the GTN. They did not find that much on the FM. So GTN was the only thing. So maybe that's a bit of an overstatement. The effect was modest, so they are saying it was modest and independent of the improvement in HbA1c. So they looked into other uh, linear modeling and all. They said that HbA1c was an independent parameter. Benefits for both vascular smooth function and HbA1c was greater than three months. This is very important. Metformin benefits in PCOS, metformin benefits in many of these diseases in the initial phase. And that is basically because of weight loss in most cases. When the participants' adherence was very high. The benefit was seen in participants who were pre-pubertal or pubertal. So it did not make a difference whether they were pubertal or pre-pubertal. There was no benefit on vascular structure, which is not possible. How will it change the structure in a year? Nor on traditional CV factors. So they say that at the moment, the only thing they are finding is that there is improvement in HPA1C and there is some improvement in the cardiovascular function. This is, so they are very modest. And they have said also that there is no improvement on traditional cardiovascular factors like lipids and everything. No effect on FMD and structure. So this is what is there. No effect on BMI in fact, reduced dose in HPLC. This would be the biggest take home that I will take from this paper from that. But I'm not that bothered about what happened to the FM and to the GTN and how much is that relevant 50 years later. But if your HBLC is down, your insulin requirement is down, that's good. Now conclusions again is that these subjects were okay. Interventions we have taken care of and objectives you already evaluated. So if you now evaluate, this was a double blind RCT, which uh, did a blinding till analysis. Test. So it's important. So nobody knew that who was the control, who was the case. So it was a good design. Follow up was intention to treat, which is a good model to look at. Is it generalizable? Subjects, intervention, and impact? Yes. So we do see so many children 8 to 18 years of age with a BMI more than 50. So we can think of these individuals as our own patient groups. We're seeing intervention is very easy, giving metformin, not a big deal. And impact is good in terms of control, moderate on CV. So we may think of thinking, considering metformin in children who are non-lean, or let's say whose BMI is more than 50th centile in that setting. So impact, so there is a role of metformin in CV outcome and insulin sensitivity is important. So metformin requires further study. We can't go by just one study of 90 children. So ultimately it is a 90 children study. Exploration of CV outcome needs to be done more and there is needs to be correlation of insulin sensitivity.
even body composition.